What's going on guys? Alex Bowles here. Today we're going to be doing another true crime case. Now this is a case that I have been following for a very long time. I've been following it since like 2018. Um, this case that I'm going to talk about is the case of Erica and BJ Sifferit. Now, now basically in this case it's a pretty interesting story because um, later in the story we're going to talk about a couple who ended up going missing while they were on a trip. And um, and basically what we're going to do is we're going to start in the beginning from from where uh, Erica and BJ met and then we're going to get to these the tragic events that happen in this story. Now let's get started. So the first person we're going to talk about in the story is Erica Sifferit. Erica Elaine Grace was born in Aquarius on February 3rd, 1978 in Roaring Spring, Pennsylvania. Her father, Mitch Grace, owned a contracting business and, and because he owned a good business, her family was really wealthy. And, and throughout this story, one of the most well-known things about Erica was when she was in school, her biggest passion was basketball and she was so determined to do great in basketball. So Mitch, her father, built an indoor basketball court and she would just practice and practice and practice. And not only would she like push herself to get better, but even her father would push her to get better. And after Erica graduated high school, she did continue basketball. So she went to Mary Washington College for four years and she she was definitely a really great player on the team. And according to her high school friend Kristen Haybaugh, which if I pronounce her last name wrong, I'm sorry, I'm so terrible with pronouncing names, she had the best three-point shot that she had ever seen of anybody and obviously Erica brought that over to her own college that she attended and when she was ready to graduate college she had uh, gotten a degree in history and political science and this is where she meets BJ Sifrit. Now she was at a bar one night with a couple of her friends and a friend of one of her friends introduced her to BJ and uh, his full name was Benjamin Adam Sifrit but um, he preferred to be called BJ. Now Benjamin Adam Sifrit was born in Libra on October 21st 1977 in Estherville, Iowa and his family moved around a lot like they would move like over and over again to Minnesota and then back to Iowa and then his sophomore year, his family moved to Houston, Texas because of uh, them getting uh, a new job in Texas. And just like Erica, BJ was also a very accomplished athlete. Like, like he was someone who was never considered lazy at all. Like, he won a lot of awards in high school uh, on his high school swim team. And he was also... And he also worked a lot of jobs. He worked in the YMCA, he was a swimming instructor, he was a lifeguard, and he even was a grocery store worker. And around his senior year of high school, BJ decided he wanted to join the military. Now, he originally thought about joining the Marines, but after talking with his parents and a recruiter, they thought that the best choice for him was the Navy. So after he graduated high school, he decided to start his training to be in the Navy, uh, the Navy SEALs to be exact. And he starts his training in Great Lakes, Illinois, which is about, about I think probably about half an hour to an hour from Chicago. And then later on, he was transferred to Coronado, California to finish. And out of 160 people enrolled in the SEALs, BJ finished first in his class. So 
he was considered one of the best seals. However, he was one of those seals that would go out and party all night and just drink and just drink and drink and he will stay out till about five in the morning and he'll either go back to the dorm and sleep for an hour or two or he will get no sleep at all. And he would run a 20 mile run the next day and just beat everybody. It was like, for BJ, it was like mind over matter. Like, instead of, you know, thinking about how tired he is, basically. And so, getting back to how BJ and Erica met. So, Mary Washington College, where Erica was attending, was in Virginia. And BJ was stationed in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And when Erica met BJ, she decided to introduce him to her parents. And she talked about wanting to get married to him, but her dad found that very out of character for her. He was like, don't you think you should wait for about a year or something to get married? Like, like he, he was like, why don't you just move in with him, get to know him a little more, and then plan to marry. And, but that's not what Erica did. Instead, three weeks into their relationship, yes, three weeks into their relationship, they elope to Vegas and get married. And obviously, like I said, everybody that knew Erica and even everybody who knew BJ was in shock that she would just whirlwind and just elope. And Kristen Hainbaugh, who I mentioned earlier, said when she reconnected with, with Erica at a shopping mall, Erica said that she was married and obviously Kristen found that so shocking because she thought that Erica would have wanted like an over-the-top wedding and invite buttloads of people to it because her dad had a lot of money like I mentioned earlier. Um, and this was when Erica told Kristen that uh, she was married on a dare, which that's kind of weird to me. Like, how do you marry someone on a dare? Like, do you play, like, truth or dare or something and be like, yeah, I dare you to marry me. Like, I kind of don't really fully understand how that would be considered a dare. Like, but, but I don't know. But, but moving on from the marriage and stuff, um, the two were actually falling on hard times because... BJ would be away for his obligations for the Navy over and over again. And Erica, who was, mind you, very possessive over him, just kept getting terrible anxiety when he left because she thinks like, oh, he's having an affair or... And she even went as far as when BJ was being sent to Alaska, she actually flew to Alaska and showed up at his barracks out of the blue. And obviously, like, that's not okay for, uh, for Navy rules. So BJ was put on probation and was then sent to North Carolina at Camp Lejeune. And eventually, like, like, Erica got so out of control that he was like, I don't know what kind of choice I should make because because he wanted to stay in the Navy so bad because that was what he dreamed of doing. But it turns out that he went AWOL a lot and was involved in insubordination. And it got so bad to the point that he just got a bad contact and dishonorable discharge in the spring of 2001. And it's just like, like I said, like, could you imagine just, just somebody just doing their own dream and it just gets all taken away just because of a very possessive person. And getting back to Erica and stuff, after BJ gets out of the Navy, Mitch and Erica set up a scrapbooking store in Altoona, Pennsylvania, which was where she mostly grew up. And uh, one thing about Erica is that she was a big scrapbooker and it was like a big hobby of hers. And and Mitch thought, you know what, maybe we should set up a business that's a little different. So that was why they set up a scrapbooking store. And not only would they, you know, have like a scrapbooking store or whatever, but they would also sell merchandise on eBay, which this is so freaking weird to me 
but she would sell Hooters merchandise. She had some weird fascination with Hooters. Like, now, don't get me wrong, a lot of us have that one restaurant that we just absolutely love and that we want to go to all the time. But, you know, it's not like how Erica was with Hooters. Like, she would actually collect merchandise anywhere she went in any Hooters that they traveled to. And getting back to talking about, you know, the problem with their relationship, I will have to admit that um, not only was Erica a big problem because she was so possessive, but another problem in the relationship that happened was BJ would do things to, like, test out their relationship. For example, uh, BJ had a big swastika tattoo on his chest, which turns out that he liked Hitler, he liked guns, and not only was that a problem, but, like, there's this one incident where, where BJ, out of the blue, came home and talked to Erica, and he said, I really would love to have kids. And she, even it came as a surprise to her as well because she never thought that BJ wanted to have a kid. But she ends up getting pregnant and within a few months, BJ then came home and was like, I never wanted kids at all. Did you really think that I wanted kids? And so he basically forced her to get an abortion. He basically said, either I, I get a coat hanger and abort the baby myself, or you get an abortion tomorrow. Your choice. And that was when she got the abortion. And she was obviously extremely upset. And this also, this also in a way, like affected her so much, she actually got a tattoo on her stomach of a cross, which actually, in in the book Cruel Death, which is about the Sifrits, it actually symbolized uh, the baby she was forced to abort. And then as she looked back, she was, she realized, you know what, because I had a drug problem, well, they actually, they always had, by they, I mean, Erica and BJ, they always had a drug problem. But because she had a drug problem and she thought about it, she was like, you know what, maybe it was best that I did this. And and as I mentioned, BJ didn't want a kid. He was basically doing that to test out if she would stay in the relationship. And the other thing is that uh, it does show that even though Erica definitely had a lot of problems, like it showed that it, it, it like she wasn't like the 100% reason of the problem. It was like, I don't know if I would say 50-50, maybe, maybe more like, uh, um, like, like she was like 80% of the problem, he was like 20% of the problem. I don't know. Now on Memorial Day weekend in 2002, BJ and Erica decided to go take a trip to Ocean City, Maryland. And you know, like obviously when you go on vacation, you do normal things that you do on vacation. Like you go to the beach, you go to restaurants and drink. But while they were there, they decided they wanted to go to a bar called Secrets and they were going to take a bus. However, when they tried to get on the bus, they didn't have the right amount of change. So they tried, you know, asking for help. And a couple named Joshua Ford and Jeannie Crutchley, who were from Virginia, was, was like, I'll pay for, for the change if you buy us a drink. And because they were, they were also going to Secrets as well. Now, Joshua Ford was 32 and Jeannie was 51. So Jeannie was a lot older than Josh, but you know, I mean, it doesn't really matter if she's older or not. But, but as I mentioned, they definitely, uh, Erica and BJ took up on their offer and they went to Secrets and bought them drinks and they sat together and talked to each other for, for a few hours until the bar closed. And right after the bar closed, they were like, why don't we go continue this party? Like, we got a hot tub and we can have a couple drinks. And so Josh and Jeannie were like, okay, we can do that. And so when they got back to the condo, they both were in the hot tub and they drank. And they were, you know, having like the time of their life. And then out of nowhere, Erica got out of the hot tub and was freaking out because she didn't know where her purse went. 
and they both end up blaming Josh and Jeannie, and it resulted to BJ pointing a gun at both Josh and Jeannie. And obviously, you know, Josh and Jeannie are freaking out, and and they're like, look, we don't have your purse. Like, why would we do this? We offered to pay for your bus, and we also, and you also offered us to buy drinks. And so, and so they were like, prove it, take your clothes off. And so they strip down, but then they run to the bathroom and lock the door. But BJ ends up shooting through the door and it hits Joshua Ford. And then he like kicks the door down and it resulted to, to Erica shooting the wall, which where, which was where Jeannie Crutchley was crouched at. And then it resulted to a hole in the wall. And right afterwards, she took a knife and stabbed Jeannie in the abdomen. Like, you know, when I was reading about this case for the first time, I couldn't imagine like the sheer fear that was coming through their heads. Like, it, it had got to be like really awful just to go through something like that. And so after they both got murdered, they had no choice but to dismember the bodies because when you go on like a vacation and you're in a condo or something, you can't like throw the bodies around your shoulder and take them down. So they had no choice but to dismember them. And while they were dismembering them, Erica claimed that BJ was in the hot tub with their heads. And I don't know how true this is. I mean, knowing how sick BJ is, uh, or how both of them are, probably wouldn't surprise me at all. But they both end up putting the dismembered body parts into trash bags, and they drove to Delaware, basically placing the uh, trash bags in various dumpsters in Delaware. And their bodies, their body parts, would eventually be discovered in the dump site in Delaware. Now, the next day, both Erica and BJ had to do some repairing in the bathroom. And actually, to be honest, there is a picture of them going to Home Depot and and it is clearly obvious that that the bathroom had been remodeled and there was still blood that was like on the floor and even there there was even like hair and like uh, hair and flesh in inside of the sink. And right after they did like the cleaning as best as they could, they straight up acted like nothing happened. And another thing is Erica, while on the trip, she got a tattoo on her side, which was the same place where she stabbed Jeannie Crotchley. Yeah, I'm, I'm not shitting you when I say that. And another thing that Erica did was she took a ring that was on Josh Ford's hand and she ended up wearing it on a chain around her neck. And from what I've heard, I they said like that there was blood that was in the ring, but it's not really clear in the pictures where she's wearing the ring around her neck. And another scenario happens while they are on the trip. So they meet up with, with a man. His name was Justin Todd Wright, but we're just gonna call him Todd in this story because that's what he is called in the Cruel Death book. And they hang out with him for hours and hours and hours and they just nonstop drink. And this is this was at Secrets where, where Joshua Ford and Jeannie Crutchley and Erica and BJ were like hanging out the few days before. And there was even a point where they drank so much that that BJ took a shot and just straight up threw up in the bar. And they basically got kicked out of the bar afterwards and when they were trying to drive back to the Seifert's condo, BJ gets a flat tire. And so Todd calls his friend, Melissa Sealing, who is from Delaware, and he says that, that they had a flat tire and they needed a ride. So she was like, okay, tell me where you guys are at. And Todd being so drunk, he couldn't really say where he was at. And Melissa Sealing has in fact confirmed that the whole situation 
left her uncomfortable from the get-go. It was because everybody was completely drunk and even though she did in fact fix the tire, with how drunk they were, they non-stop asked her to buy drinks and she was just like, you guys drank too much, I don't want to. But yet they still begged her and begged her to the point where she was like, okay, just one. And they go to a restaurant called the Phillips Crab House and this is where Erica documents the event and there are in fact pictures of Melissa Sealing, Todd Wright, and BJ all together. And eventually all four go back to the Sifritz condo and like with Joshua Ford and Jeannie Crutchley, they played the same scenario over and over again with them. Claiming that Erica's purse was missing and and uh, BJ threatens them with a gun and obviously it leaves Todd and Melissa, mostly Melissa, freaked out because for Melissa she had always had a fear of guns and one of the biggest things she was focused on was the day after she had to drive home because she was flying to Hawaii and she luckily Actually, well, well, both of them were able to leave before things ended up getting out of control. So thankfully they weren't hurt, but at the same time, I can't imagine how scary that scenario was. Now on May 3rd, 2002, police responded to a silent alarm that happened outside of a Hooters restaurant in Ocean City, Maryland. And they discovered both Erica and BJ Sifra, and they end up handcuffing them. But this results in Erica straight up panicking and being like, I need my medication, I need my medication, I need my medication. So, so the officers were like, okay, tell us where it's at. And she said, oh, it's in my purse. So they look into her purse and what do they find? The Virginia driver's licenses of Joshua Ford and Jeannie Crutchley. And not only that, but they also found a key to the Alanis condominiums where Josh and Jeannie were staying. And they also look into the Sifferts condo and they find a cache of photographs and on the top of it was a picture of Jeannie and Joshua partying as secrets and there were two spent bullets on the table and one of them had blood on it and when they tested out the DNA it turned out that the bullet that had blood in it was Josh's so they basically pulled it out of his body and pretty much kept it as a trophy now the next day when they were taken to custody BJ claims that he had nothing to do with Josh and Jeannie's murder he claimed that he was asleep in the Jeep and Erica straight up went to him and was like, hey, I did something really terrible. I need you to help me. Which, to be honest, like, seeing what happened in this scenario, yeah, it, it, it definitely doesn't add up. Because, like I said, the door was kicked down and Erica was very skinny, almost anorexic skinny. So there's no way in hell she would have kicked a locked door down, unlike BJ, who is a strong and a very tall man. And then Erica claims that BJ had acted on his own and the only thing that she did was help dispose of the bodies. But however, when she was asked to do a polygraph, she completely changed her story and it turned out that she was more involved in the homicides than she originally said. And so police were like, okay, tell us where the bodies are at. And she kept saying that they dumped them around different dumpsters in Delaware. And the police eventually end up finding Josh and Jeannie's body in the dump site in Delaware. Now in the end, Erica was found guilty of first degree murder and one count of second degree murder and was sentenced to life plus 20 years in prison. And for some reason, the, the prosecutors believed BJ had nothing to do with the murder for some reason. So he was only found guilty of second degree murder of Jeannie Crutchley and was sentenced to 38 years in prison, which was absolutely ridiculous because supposedly he wasn't convicted in uh, 
Joshua Ford's death, and especially since his story does not add up one single bit. Now, in the end, in 2010, BJ and Erica divorced while they were still in prison, and BJ was supposedly eligible for parole in 2021, which was about a year ago. But from what I've heard, I don't think he is out of prison, which I hope to God he isn't. But Erica is supposed to be eligible for parole in 2024, which, like I said, hopefully does not happen either. In the end, it's like this case always really fascinated me because, because like both BJ and Erica had a perfectly normal life. So like... To me, it's just weird that that somebody that, that may have like a pretty regular life would do this. And it's just, and it's just like, what? And, and like the whole time when I was reading about this case, it really made me wonder like who could be so cold-blooded to kill somebody, like not just in general, but even on freaking vacation. Like that was clearly why this case got solved quickly was because it happened in a condo and it wasn't cleaned up very well. Alright guys, thanks for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed my true crime video that I have not done in a long time. And I'll see you guys soon. Bye guys.